Hi, I'm Dr. Billy Redslav and welcome back to ABA-ish. Today's video is going to be a little more ABA than ish as this is a video that's really geared towards anybody who's conducting functional behaviors as assessments or FBAs. So this might be educators, especially special education teachers, um, school psychologists, behavior interventionists, BCBAs, anybody who's part of that FBA process. I want you to watch this video and hear me when I say that using the term control or manipulation as in a function of behavior behavior is not an appropriate description. I think that these are such toxic descriptions to use because they make it seem like there's something about that student themselves that is bad, that is negative, right? It's sort of like this internal characteristic about what they want to do. And in reality, we want to focus on the outcomes of their behaviors so that we know what we should intervene on to change. So as some of you know, I've worked in level four schools um, and I've supported especially EBD students. Um, so those are students receiving their special education services under the diagnosis or the label of emotional behavior disorder. And these kids tend to be the kids that I see control and manipulation as the function of behavior a lot. Um, and again, it just it puts that on something about that kid that is the problem rather than something about the environment, which we can then intervene on and change. Right. As the adults in the room, we don't control things about that kid or their internal state, but we do control the environment that we're in. So today I'm going to give you some alternative descriptions of behavior functions that I think are more appropriate for different situations in which I've seen control and manipulation used. So as a quick reminder, when I'm talking about the function of a behavior, I'm talking about the reason or the purpose of the behavior. What outcome does that behavior produce, even if it's only some of the time, that is makes it worth it for the individual? What maintains it? What keeps that behavior happening? And really common um, behavior functions that we talk about are things like escaping non-preferred or, you know, getting out of something you don't want to do, getting access to attention or tangible preferred items, preferred activities. And then we also often talk about an automatic or a sensory function, meaning that behavior itself is producing the outcome that is maintaining it. However, these are all pretty simple functions when you break them down and describe them that way. And we know that student behavior is really complex. So we also have to consider really complex functions, which includes functions that happen on a larger time scale. So meaning that the outcome of my behavior isn't something that happens right after the behavior, but it's down the road. Um, and again, that can be a really probabilistic outcome as well. So something that's really important for you guys to know is that this is a topic that has a lot less research data behind it. When we look at those more simple functions, there's just a ton of data out there looking at those functions, how we intervene, how we demonstrate function, and all of that information. But because these more complex functions happen on a larger time scale a lot and can be a lot more um, difficult and nuanced, it tends to be that there's less research on these functions. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is from my experience consulting and working directly in schools with students um, and trying to help you guys shape how you can talk about it when it does seem like a student is trying to control or manipulate a situation um, and hopefully talk about it in a way that isn't negative towards that student and keeps the focus on what is happening in the environment that we can attempt to intervene upon. Okay, so whenever you're conducting an FBA, the question you really need to be asking yourself is, what is that thing that if it didn't happen, the behavior would not happen? What is the outcome, no matter how probabilistic that outcome is, that is sufficient and controlling enough to keep the behavior going for the student? So oftentimes when people feel like that outcome is control or manipulation, it's actually one of these three things going on. So the first is an increased compliance with the individual request. So meaning that the, the student's inappropriate behavior makes it more likely that people will honor their request. The next is a maintenance or an increase in social status, meaning that overall the inappropriate behavior is getting them access to more peer attention, um, perhaps more access to preferred items or preferred activities. It's elevating that overall social status, which comes with a whole bunch of other reinforcers. And then the third one is an avoidance of a negative interaction, meaning that just by behaving inappropriately on the long term, there's less negative interactions that that individual has to deal with. All right, so let's take these one by one and break them down really quick. 
The first, like I said, was that increased compliance with an individual request, meaning that my inappropriate behavior makes it more likely that people will honor my request. Let me give you a couple examples because I think that's really helpful for this one. Let's imagine we have a kid who says, can I have a cookie to a parent? And the parent's like, nope, we're gonna have dinner soon. And so then the kid throws a fit. They might be yelling, screaming, crying, kicking, hitting, on the floor, whatever it is. And the parent's calming them down and trying to work through it. And the parent tells them, you know, hey, use your words. Tell me what you want. And the kid sniffles and is like, can I have a cookie, please? And the parent's like, oh, thank you so much for using your words. Here's your cookie. From that parent perspective, they waited for an appropriate response of request before they gave in. And so they're feeling pretty good about themselves. You know, Dr. Billy is always telling me, get that appropriate behavior. But the problem with this sequence is that the inappropriate behavior changed the answer to the request, right? And so that's where kids can learn kind of on this scale of, hey, my inappropriate behavior can make it more likely that people will do what I want them to do. Now, it's important to note that I talk about that as if it's a conscious process, the kid knows what they're doing. It doesn't have to be that way. There's lots of times where the kid cannot describe what's happening and it's still controlling their behavior. A lot of times a parent can't describe what's happening either, yet it's still controlling behavior. So it's okay if it's not this conscious process, but this is the sequence that is leading to more inappropriate behavior because it's paying off. It's getting them an increased compliance with those requests. Now we can think about a similar example for perhaps an older kid in a school setting. So let's say for example, a kid requests something that's not available. You know, maybe they ask the teacher to uh, type their answers instead of write them on the computer and the teacher says, no, that's not available. Or they ask for access to their phone or technology and the teacher says, no. Anything where they're requesting something and the teacher tells them it's not available. And then the kid engages in inappropriate behavior. Now, for a lot of students, we have behavior plans in place, and so the teacher may not honor that request even if the kid asks appropriately. They might not get into that same sequence we got into with the parent and the cookie. We might, but we might not. Let's say we don't, just so we can see another example. So the question here becomes, what's going to happen a week later when the kid asks for something similar? Is that teacher going to say no to a similar request, right? If the last time I told this kid no, that wasn't available, they destroyed my classroom, they ripped up the artwork on the walls, they made a huge mess, maybe they even were physically aggressive or verbally said mean things to me. If I get asked this again, in the back of my head, even if it's not conscious, you know, am I going to say no or am, this time am I going to say yes to avoid that big burst? And again, because it's happening on that larger time frame, sometimes people don't really recognize that that is actually reinforcing that behavior that happened a while ago. So when we're talking about a student who's trying to control or intimidate somebody, what are we really talking about? Well, most of the time what we're saying is they want other people to do what they want. So that increased compliance is going to get the student overall more reinforcement. Maybe they're going to get out of doing work more often. They're going to get more attention. They're going to get more preferred things, whatever it is. They're overall getting more reinforcement because people are honoring their requests more in hopes of keeping that behavior at bay. So that becomes the function. The function of this behavior is to increase the likelihood that people will comply with my request. Okay, our next kind of overall function can be this maintenance or increase in social status. So this can be really similar to peer attention, but I think the difference here is that this tends to happen on a much larger time frame, and it might not be quite as obvious. So you can think of an example where a kid is in a classroom and they say something funny but inappropriate and other kids laugh. And we would say that's maintained by peer attention because the peers laughing is what keeps them saying those inappropriate things. But there's also this situation in which, you know, on a broader time scale, I want to just keep my social status or increase my social status because that will result in overall more reinforcement for me. So if I can overall have a higher social status within the you know, the community setting that I'm in, that might get me more access to attention, more tangibles, people might be doing things for me, so it might get me escape from certain things. 
And so this overall maintenance or increase in social status can be really hard to see in the moment. You know, it's not very common that in the moment something inappropriate happens and people come up and are like, hey, now I want to be more of your friend. I want to, you know, have you be more popular. That's not how it works. It's this gradual over time increase or maintenance of those social statuses. I think we see this sometimes with fighting too, where, you know, other people step in and kind of fight with other people on a team. That can be an example in which jumping in and being part of that inappropriate behavior might get me a little bit more social status with that individual. So if this is somebody that I really want to be friends with, I want them to invite me places, I want them to give me time, attention, um, preferred activities, whatever it is, I can jump in and be part of this fight and that may increase the likelihood in the future that they have me be part of those. So sometimes I hear people talk about loyalty as another reason that kids engage in inappropriate behavior. I think that that really ties back to maintaining that social status. They want to show those individuals that they are loyal to them because maintaining that status maintains their access to reinforcement. Okay, and our third and final one is an avoidance of negative interactions. So we know that inappropriate behavior may serve that immediate response of escaping a negative interaction. So say two kids are engaging in a negative interaction and one of them hits the other one, that may immediately stop that interaction. You know, a lot of times it does because adults come running and break up the fight and they stop that interaction in the moment. So that's that immediate reinforcer. But we also have to remember that there can be this avoidance piece. What I mean by that is that there may be an overall reduction in the likelihood of similar negative interactions in the future. So if you think about this, it might be, you know, if I've hit you once, are you going to say something negative to me again? But it could also be for people who witness or hear about this, they may be less likely to engage in negative interactions with that inter individual, right? If everybody knows that Billy tends to blow up at people who say something mean about her hair, well, probably less people are going to say mean things about my hair if they don't want to um, feel that you know outcome. They don't want to be the one who gets hit. So it can be that there is this avoidance. It hasn't happened yet, but if people know that in general this is how I respond, there's a decreased likelihood that they'll do something similar in the future. So again, it's that larger time frame that we have to be looking on to see what that really um, that reinforcer really is, that maintaining variable really is. So these are those three really quick ones that I use. Sorry, where's my screen? Um, so increase compliance with an individual's request. I engage in inappropriate behavior because it increases the likelihood that you'll do what I ask you to do either now or in the future. A maintenance or increase in social status. I engage in this behavior because it increases or maintains my social status, which increases or maintains my access to social reinforcers from peers. And then finally, that avoidance of negative interactions. So these behaviors serve the purpose of people not doing inappropriate or negative negative things to me in the future. Hopefully this was helpful in um, helping you kind of conceptualize how you can talk about students who maybe previously you've described as controlling or manipulating. Again, I think these are more helpful because they point to what is happening, what is the outcome in the environment that is maintaining that behavior instead of something about the person themselves that's maintaining it. I'm going to post a video soon that talks about intervention for these types of functions as that can be more challenging as well. So be on the lookout for that. And if this is helpful, please, please subscribe and share with those in your network who might benefit. Thanks so much. Have a great day.